Please join me in welcoming Tyler Cowan. First, I'm going to talk at you, and then I'm going to show you pictures. What I'd like to do today is cover everything. So to offer or serve up my theory of everything. Now, this is a somewhat unusual endeavor. As you probably know, in most of social science, you don't try to understand everything. It's really hard just to understand one small bit. You try to come up with a hypothesis with some evidence. You hope it's not completely dented by criticism. And maybe at the end, you produce one small brick that goes into the edifice of science. But when you're living in what are called transformational times, you will observe that other people out there are attempting to give you their narrative of everything. What is going on? Why does the world occasionally, at times, appear to be a little strange? Uh, why is this not exactly what they promised me in 1997? So there's a Steve Bannon narrative of everything. There's a Paul Krugman narrative of everything. And today, I will give you, I guess, you have to call it the Tyler Cowan narrative of everything. Now, when you give a narrative of everything, there are many claims put out. And inevitably, some of those claims will turn out to be wrong. But also, one hopes, some will turn out to be true. But I have the sense that economists, in some regards, they underinvest in narratives, trying to make sense of our world as a big picture thing. It's riskier. It's easier for other people to criticize. But I fear if economists and also philosophers leave narratives only to people who I feel are, in some ways, incorrect, uh, then they will rule that area of how people think about the broader world. And I'd just like to nudge people a bit back to the Tyler Cowen point of view. But keep in mind, you know, some of the things I'm going to tell you very, very likely will turn out to be wrong. But it's just how I'm fitting the pieces together of what is going on in our world. And first, let me lay out, before we get to the pictures, I guess you would say four factors that I think are ruling the Western world today. And they're quite abstract, but I think when you put them together, you get some version of what we're seeing happening before our eyes. Now, the first is what I call the exhaustion of our general purpose technology. It's a very abstract term. Let me make that concrete. There was an incredible revolution, an economic and social revolution in the 19th century. It starts with the Industrial Revolution, but it actually picks up real steam, literally, I'll say, after our Civil War. And I view the big technological breakthrough as combining fossil fuels, powerful machines, and electricity. We, meaning this country, Europe, other parts of the world, figured out how to do those things. And that changed everything. We went from a globe where people lived more or less at subsistence for thousands of years to something like the living standards we now enjoy. So starting in the 19th century and moving up through some part of the 20th century, what we did is we took these technologies, machines, fossil fuels, electricity, and we did with them everything we could think of. So we built cars. We built factories. Factories then built a lot of the stuff you see in Walmart. We came up with airplanes, right? Fast locomotives, fast sailing ships, not just relying on wind. Electricity eventually led to the internet also. You can look at so many of the important technological advances, and you can see them as an outgrowth of that general purpose technology, like fossil fuels and machines. They did wonders. But here's the thing. At some point in the late 20th century, and you can debate when, we started to exhaust the possibilities of combining fossil fuels with machines. So when was the car invented? Well, actually, a long time ago. When did the car in this country become truly commonplace? You could say after World War II. You could say the 1920s. That also was a while ago. But the car was a huge advance over a horse and buggy. What are we doing now with cars? So I've been driving cars now for a while. I'm 55 years old. My mother gave me her car when I was 17. I now uh, own a Korean car, Hyundai Sonata. It's very nice. Uh, I don't get flat tires as often. 
It has a better sound system. It has satellite radio. I'm not even sure it's more comfortable. It has less space, actually. It's still a car. So what I think has happened in many of the world's advanced countries is our previous economic growth machine, it has slowed down. For the most part, not because of anyone's fault, but because we did what we could have with our big breakthrough. Look at airplanes. A lot of the planes that are flown now actually were designed in the late 1960s. I flew on them in the 1970s, and you know what? Today, they don't go any faster. The trip is slower because you have to get through TSA security, right? And then traffic to the airport is worse. Parking is a bigger hassle because the lot is further away. So imagine that, going like 40, 50 years and flying doesn't get faster. That, to me, is an important fact about the Western world. Sometimes, you know, I live in Northern Virginia, basically DC. Sometimes I take the train up to New York City, the Asela, and you know what? It doesn't go any faster than it did in the 1970s. So maybe in some ways it's a superior experience, but I'm not sure how, frankly. Uh, I guess I can read on my Kindle when I'm on the train or look at my smartphone and text. But still, the train itself, same train, same corridor, same speed. So because we've exhausted to some extent the previous big breakthrough and we're just doing tweaks and marginal improvements on it, the rate of economic growth has slowed down in this country, most of Western Europe, Japan, you could say countries that have a lot of oil or maybe an exception, but this is a pretty widespread phenomenon. The slowdown in the rate of economic growth, pictures you will see later. The second feature of our current time, like the technology fact, this has been going on for a while. As a society, we are wealthier, and overall, on average, we are older. These facts are not in dispute. And when people get wealthier and older, how does their behavior change? Well, in a number of ways, but one thing they do is they wish to consume more safety. They wish to take fewer risks. You know, since I'm being taped, I guess I can't tell you these stories. <laughs> but when I was young, I did some things that I shouldn't talk about on tape. <laughs> that were pretty risky. And you might think, oh, when you're young, you play it safe because you have your whole life to lose. And then when you get to be, you know, 77, well, that's when you take all the risks because you figure, oh, my goodness, you know, maybe I only have five, 10 years left. Let's go crazy taking risks. But it's not how it works. For whatever reason, human nature is such that young people take more risk and Older people, on average, take less risk. Furthermore, as people get wealthier, they want and indeed they get safer jobs. They want and indeed they get safer cars. So now, I don't even call them cars. They're these big monster boxes, right? And you ride up high, and if someone hits you, but you know, with their Hyundai Sonata, if I'm like driving, I just ram you on the side, you don't even notice. Because in your big box, you're so safe. So people do so many things to try to make their lives safer. Uh, you invest more, you spend more on health care. Not that all these work, but overall your life does become safer. You become more risk averse. This in the longer run can make society less dynamic. But people play it more safe as they are older and wealthier. And in social science, there's pretty good evidence for that. So if we as a society are older and wealthier, you can expect that we as a society are going to play it safer. Third factor, and this I feel is quite contingent. The other two are pretty well established general regularities. But this third factor, I feel, is a kind of temporary accident. It could change almost any time. It's been true for a short while. It doesn't follow from any general principles, but I feel it's true nonetheless. And that is, oh, where's my smartphone? Somewhere I have one. That's very. Information technology. Most of you have cell phones, smartphones. Information technology has evolved in such a way that the return to staying at home has gone up more than the return to being productive at work. Again, this is contingent. It could change. But just think about some of the best innovations. 
Amazon. I love Amazon. Amazon is my favorite company. It's weird to me that Amazon is bought, has bought Whole Foods. And you know what they did? They lowered the prices. So I go to Whole Foods and I save money. Do you know what I do with that money? I spend it on Amazon, right? <laughs> like they get all, all my money, all my paycheck, all paycheck, and I'm happy. Uh, but anyway, Amazon, I can sit at home, I don't know for how long, and just click, 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 and they will send me things. <laughs> I, folks, I can stream movies, they will send me stamps. If I want tennis balls, do you think I go to a sporting goods store, given that there's more traffic congestion and the car doesn't go any faster and it's just like a car from the 1970s? No, I just sit at home, click, click. I want to watch something. I still go out to the cinema, but I see every year I go, fewer other people go, you can sit at home, watch TV, you can do streaming, you can sit at home, you can text your friends. <coughs> There's some surveys, like how often do teenagers get together and see each other five or six times a week. 30, 40 years ago, this was the norm. You'd have a group of friends, you'd see each other, maybe not literally every day, but at least five times a week. You'd hang out. Now, this happens quite rarely. Maybe you see your friends twice a week, and you text them all the time, right? This increases the return to staying home. It makes leisure time more efficient. Facebook is a form of leisure. People spend a lot of time on Facebook. Believe it or not, it is not a form of work. I know you might like to feel it, but it's not. So in my view, information technology so far has made leisure a lot better, but it hasn't actually boosted productivity that much in the workplace. In some ways, it may have harmed productivity, because instead of working, you're checking your Twitter feed or your Facebook page. Again, I think this is temporary. It doesn't have to be this way. But it's the third fact I want to cite. And overall, it makes us, in some ways, more lethargic, less adventurous, more stay at home, less out there exploring or trying to transform geographic space. And I'll get to this word in a moment, but it makes us just a bit more complacent. That's the third factor. Fourth factor, and this is simply from history. It's not economics, it's not really philosophy, uh, but I do feel it's another independent factor. And my theory of everything is the modern world is these four factors coming together and making us all some very particular way, which eventually will have to change. That way I'm going to call complacency. But the fourth factor is simply the history of the 1960s and the 1970s, which a small number of you in this room remember or know quite well, uh, but I believe most of you do not. But just for a quick refresher course in history, in the 1960s and 1970s, crime rates were much, much higher than they are today. To give a simple example, in the city of New York, the murder rate was way back then. How many times higher than now? Do you think twice as high, three times as high? It was 20 times as high. Most of New York City, even the Upper East Side, you were nervous. Uh, neighborhoods that now are gentrified, completely safe, you were afraid to go in back, say, in the 1970s, even if you carried a knife. You'd be like, I'm not going to go there. So New York City, many parts of America, they have become much safer. In the 1960s, we had this thing called the Vietnam War, which was a terrible catastrophe killed many, many Vietnamese and, of course, a fair number of Americans. We had a president, Richard Nixon. I won't go into detail. Let's just say it was a strange experience. <laughs> and he ended up resigning, because otherwise he would have been impeached. Uh, it was very common back then for bombs to go off every day. Multiple bombs went off in the United States. It was not Islamic terrorism. It was homegrown Americans protesting one thing or another. Yes, mostly very small bombs. But some years, like five bombs, would go off every day. You had riots, protests, on a scale that, if all you know is the current day, seem difficult to imagine. So you have people coming out of the 60s and the 70s and basically saying, you know, my goodness, this is kind of horrible. We want to change America. We want to make it much safer, more orderly. 
We don't want to repeat a mistake like the Vietnam War. We don't want five bombs going off a day. Europe, by the way, you hear today about terrorism in Europe. In the 1970s, there were more terrorist acts in Europe than there are today. Again, by different parties. You have, you know, Red Army faction in Germany, you have the Irish Republican Army in Great Britain, and so on. But terrorism was a bigger thing back then. Planes were hijacked pretty frequently, uh, more so than they are today. So anyway, 60s, 70s, people are saying, we can't take this anymore. We are going to change our world and make it safer as a kind of reaction against how things were. And the good news is, but also partly a little bit the bad news, is that for the most part, they succeeded. So, you know, in the 1990s, crime rates start to fall. They keep on falling. They fall much more than anyone expected. Many of America's cities revive. They gentrify. Uh, the 80s and 90s are one of the most peaceful eras, calm eras in American history. For the most part, things don't seem that weird. And we have this, I would say, 20, 25 year span where many things are getting better. It feels like America, you know, morning in America again. That's what Ronald Reagan said. So we made this country safer, but we kept on pushing out on that curve and kept on wanting to make it safer and safer and safer. And I have the sense that in some ways we reacted against that earlier period too much. We obsessed over safety, lost some dynamism. Just a simple example. In the 1960s, as you know, we put a man on the moon in 1969. We didn't really decide we were going to do that until the early 60s. So essentially, we got that done from start to finish with joke-level computers. I mean joke-level computers, way worse than my iPhones. Sent men to the moon multiple times in basically seven years of work. Today, it can be the case that a road needs to be redone, and it can take seven years. The big dig in Boston, that took <coughs> decades. The Tap NZ Bridge in New York State, when I was a kid, they talked about redoing it. Finally, the new Tap NZ Bridge just reopened. It can take seven years to rename a bridge, <laughs> much less build a new one. So there was something about the dynamism of that earlier time, a can-do spirit, higher levels of chaos, higher risk-taking, extreme danger, and chaos in some regards. And we decided to put that behind us for contingent historical reasons. So my theory of everything to put together a few of the pieces, is these four trends have converged on us today, and we have been living in a deeply weird time that to most of us actually feels normal because it's the main thing we have known. I would say this deeply weird time, for the most part, started in the early 1980s and then really picked up a lot of steam in the 1990s. And that is a kind of time of complacency, older, more risk averse, slower levels of progress, less risk taking, in some areas wonderful advances like the internet, but they tend to keep us at home. And then our historical imagination has been narrowed. So I would say many of us have lost the ability to imagine a future that is fundamentally different from the present we live in. When you ask, how might the world be different? I take my grandmother, born at the beginning of the 20th century. When she was born, it's about 6% of Americans finish high school, not college, high school. Most live on farms. There are no vaccines, no antibiotics, running water, maybe, electricity, a luxury, hardly taken for granted. Hardly anyone had a car. When she was born, by the time she's 50, what's different? Everything's different. You're in the mid-50s. Lots of Americans have cars. I wouldn't say everyone has electricity, but most homes have it. Clean water, of course. Vaccines, antibiotics. You're in a completely whole new world. People are starting to fly. Television has gotten going. In her life, her sense of like the physical topography of American existence changed totally. And if you read science fiction from that period, the writers have the expectation that our physical worlds, our infrastructure, will continue to change at very rapid paces. 
And they're like, oh my goodness, what kind of utopia could be around the corner? Peter Thiel's standard joke about the flying car. When are we going to have flying cars? You ever see that cartoon in the Jetsons? It's an old cartoon. In the Jetsons, they have flying cars. I still do not have my flying <laughs> car. I'm not really expecting a safe one anytime soon. I mean, you could put wings on your car, but getting it to go up and down, it's, it's not really going to go that well. So today, when you ask people, like, how might your world change? They imagine, well, some more ethnic restaurants open up in my favorite city. Uh, people are nicer to each other, which is great. I mean, the world is nicer today. America is a nicer country uh, in many regards. Uh, if you're, say, someone who is gay, in the 1960s, 1970s, it was extremely difficult for the most part. Today, it might be difficult, but it's a far, far better existence you have today if you grow up and in some way are different. In many, but not all cases. It's a nicer country. But when people think about the future, they just imagine like a slight accretion on to the present. Well, you know, there'll be more music on Spotify, <laughs> iPhone 10. I mean, it's a lot better than iPhone 1. Is it a lot better than iPhone 6? Well, we don't have it yet, but it doesn't sound that way, right? Even like in the world of tech, where it's like temporary stultification. There's Amazon, there's Facebook, there's Google. You know what they do, they're there, okay, great service, but kind of staying put. People think of the world as they know it, as how the world will be. We've lost that sense of vivid, bold imagination. So you put those four things together, and you have, in essence, what is the book I just published, and that is called The Complacent Class. And what I mean by the complacent class is that we, as a collective nation, with many exceptions, but as a collective nation, are more risk-averse, progress is slower. On the whole, we're probably nicer and more tolerant. We're less dynamic. And some people see the title, the complacent class. They're like, who's the complacent class? They want it to be like some group of people over there. Like, or the complacent class, like they're the people who didn't vote and they let like this person get elected. Or the complacent class, they're the people who didn't do this. I mean, maybe, but the point of my title is, you know, in the broad sense, we're all the complacent class at different income levels, at different education levels. We're segregating ourselves more. I'll get to that. But we're, we're much more willing to put up with things because we fear that the costs of transition are painful. We don't like risk. We don't like pain. So when we have unacceptable situations, what do we do? We put up with them. We ignore them. We try to make the things nice that we can make nice. We have a lower but still positive rate of economic growth. And uh, we have pretty nice lives. I sometimes say, you know, it's mediocrity that is greatly underrated. To have a life of peaceful mediocrity is actually almost as good, or in some ways better, than having like the very best life you can imagine. So that we're the complacent class, you might think in a way I'm complaining, maybe in some ways I am, but you need to realize that we did away with how things were in the 1960s and 1970s, because in some fundamental ways that wasn't working. It was too dangerous, it was too risky, we did some really stupid things, we were too intolerant, and to have a comfortable life is one of the greatest of all blessings in this world. And of course, today you can still go to other countries and see people who do not have comfortable lives and ask, you know, are you looking to migrate there? There are plenty of people who will talk at length about how those lives might be more interesting or more dramatic or more rich or more human. But when you ask the simple question, where are the people migrating? I see very few Americans migrating to the countries where those lives are more numerous. And I see a fair number of people from those countries either migrating here or at least trying to migrate here. So, uh, you know, we're built for comfort. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is at the collective level, when everyone gets too comfortable about comfort, you get some problems. So now let me show you a few pictures. Here's one about America, just one. I'll show you many more. 
cliche about this country used to always be how much people would move around. That we would pull up house, look for the new frontier, move to another state at the drop of a hat. That we were dynamic, and those poor Western Europeans, they would just stay put near their parents in the neighborhood they grew up with. They didn't want to give up their favorite bread or sausage or linguistic dialect. And my goodness, we dynamic Americans, we moved all the time. That was Tocqueville's portrait of this country, actually. And there has been a lot of truth to that, and we still move more than typically Western Europeans would. But when you look at this data series, the percentage of Americans who move across state lines in a given year, this is pretty unambiguous. It is obviously declining. We move less and less. We are less likely to strike out, take a big chance, go to some other state for a better existence. Why is this declining? I think there's a few reasons. One is simply our mentality has changed. But I suspect the most important reason is simply there are few regions of this country that are booming. There's a lot of regions where the economy is doing fine. This typically is one of them. So there's net inflow here. But in the 19th or early 20th sense of having a region that is truly booming, like the California gold rush, or like Detroit in the post-World War II era, earlier on, we don't have that much anymore. The main area we've had it is the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, San Francisco. That's been booming, people doing and making some incredible things. But the number of people who move there is pretty small. For one thing, it costs a fortune because they don't allow much building anymore. For another thing, it's actually pretty hard to have the tech skills to contribute to those companies. And the main companies out there, they employ way fewer people than, say, General Motors used to at its peak, or even McDonald's used to. Uh, so our one like boom area, Silicon Valley, doesn't drive that much migration. So we stay put more. This cements our mentality of, well, things don't change that much. I don't want to be disrupted that much. Uh, here you see it in this number. Next picture. This to me is the scariest single picture about the United States today. This is median male income. So by median, we mean typical. So if there's like 11 men in the country, you know, the sixth richest is the median, the one in the middle. If you look at male median income today, there's actually another year's worth of data just released by, was it, last week. It's basically at about where it was in 1972. In fact, if you take the newest of figures, not shown in this picture, but where it is today is pretty much exactly equal to 1972. And that, to me, as an economist, is astonishing that we have had decades pass. 1972, right? It's 45 years ago. And the average male is not earning more. Now, you might challenge, like, how good are these numbers? You could say, I think with some justification, well, there are some things we get today that are free that are not counted in these numbers. So if people today are nicer or more tolerant, that's not really counted in these numbers. You can read today Wikipedia for free. That's not counted in these numbers. But no, the internet is becoming more and more commercialized. So the internet more and more is counted in these numbers. So I do feel these numbers are off a bit. There are some unmeasured quality improvements that the typical male is today actually better off than the typical male in 1972. But simply that this comparison would be possible. If you went back to 1972 and picked like two economists, a liberal, a conservative, Paul Samuelson, Milton Friedman, and you said, Paul Milton, the world is going to have mostly free trade, communism will fall, and no nuclear war. What's going to happen to median male income? They wouldn't say, hmm, these numbers are tricky. It might go up, it might go down. Who knows? They'd say, no, it's going to go up 2% a year. What did we see? Flat. <coughs> this means, A, our country is screwed up. It means, B, a lot of you men are screwed up. And I see a few of you in the audience. Uh, for female incomes, those go up more or less steadily, more in better education, also less discrimination, greater ambition. That's great. 
But this also shows you how much the economic growth we've had has been driven by women and not by typical male earners. But this is a sign of the slowdown in American life. To me, the single biggest oh my god fact about the American economy that you can come up with. Again, I don't feel these numbers are completely reflecting the reality, but still, that it's possible at all. Here's another median wage figure. This is uh, not just for men. This is a 10-year moving average. You can see that very recently, you know, since about 2000, 2001, wages for typical earners in this country, they have not been doing great. Right now, they're in recovery. Uh, last year, they recovered e even more so, which, which is good. We'd rather have recovery. But if you're wondering why is our politics sometimes so polarized, so strange, why are people upset? Again, I don't feel these numbers are perfect measures of all the quality improvements. But you look at this and you realize it's a very different America. If you go back, if you look at the 1950s, the 1960s, pretty much in a typical year, median wages go up 2 to 3%. Sometimes they go up more than 3%. Now it's like, eh, very different picture. So in terms of rates of change, the earlier America was more dynamic, less tolerant, we're now more risk averse, taking fewer chances, less dynamic, but have a nicer daily existence. If you look at real GDP, you know, goods and services produced, for those of you who are not economists, the 10-year moving average, what does that look like? I have a lot of gloomy graphs today, actually. <laughs> I'm not actually that much of a pessimist. I sometimes say I am a happiness optimist and a revenue pessimist. This is a graph about revenue. I can't graph happiness. I don't know how to measure it. It is my belief, my subjective belief, that today people are in critical regards happier than these numbers will indicate. But if you ask our rate of economic growth, is it slowing down? Here's a 10-year moving average. It's another way of looking at some of the same facts. This is starting in the mid-1980s. It's pretty much gloomy all the way through. And if you want to ask why, I would go back to those four factors I outlined at the beginning. We're in the midst of this perfect storm of the complacency with the risk aversion, the lower dynamism, hitting those technological plateaus, seeking greater safety, taking fewer chances, staying at home more, all of that coming together. And you get this. Uh, this next one is a little more technical. It's, it's a productivity graph. I won't talk you through it. Uh, but it shows basically productivity seems to be going down. That is the rate of growth of productivity is going down. So if you look at productivity growth numbers for all of American history, it seems our productivity growth was highest in the 1920s and 1930s. That's when the basic building blocks of the modern world were put into place. Things that, say, people in China have been doing over the last 20, 30 years, we were doing in the 20s and 30s. We had very rapid gains. Now our gains are slower. There's one estimate. Again, always be careful with counterfactuals. But if you can somehow magically graft earlier rates of productivity growth onto our last 40 or so years, the typical family in this country Right now, they're earning $59,000 a year, typical household. If you could graft on those earlier rates of productivity growth, that typical family would be earning about $100,000 a year. So if you're trying to live somewhere on 60K or 100K, is that like a small difference or is that a big difference? I say for most people, it's really a big difference. 60K, you're just trying to pay your bills and rent and Everywhere is more expensive now, and you want to live in a good school district, and you might have to pay for some of your health care and saving for your kids to go to college. Having that 100K instead of 60K, big, big difference. Right now, our typical household income is at 60K. Again, in this weird counterfactual, just waving a wand, not saying there's a way it could have been true, but had we maintained earlier rates of productivity growth, we'd be up at about 100K. But we're not. You know, I was a little critical of males before, and I would just stress this again, that a lot of the social problems in this country 
or social problems of males. And you see that reflected in workforce behavior. <coughs> so if you look at prime age men, you know, men in their, their 20s, 30s, 40s, working force age, not men about to retire, not 14 year olds. <coughs> what percentage don't have a job and are not even looking for work? By these measurements, it's over 12% at times. And you look at the trend. The trend is obvious, right? It's going up. There was a new paper, it just came out last week by Adam Kruger. Kruger estimates, I haven't read the paper yet, but he estimates a fifth of these men, their main problem is they're taking opioids. A fifth, that's a lot. But if you're like a 27-year-old guy, able-bodied, not on disability, which, by the way, is easier to get than it used to be, even though jobs are safer. You're not on disability. You're 27. You're just sitting at home, and you're not working. What are your life prospects? What's your level of ambition? Well, it depends. But if you're a little worried, I would say this graph reflects that worry. And this is one way of measuring a class of people that has become more complacent content to just sit at home. Sometimes there's opioids involved, smoking of marijuana, viewing of pornography, playing of video games. Sometimes it's just being an extreme nerd. It's wrong to think like these are just some group of stupid people. They're not. But this is a social problem. And these numbers really are not contested. Another look at what's also going on with young people. Uh, this I find worrying, but this, I can see how you could interpret this one either way. If you look at the red line, the red line is percentage of not college educated young adults living with their parents. What's happening to that line? It's going up, right? So people are living at home for longer. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. You help out around the house, maybe you take care of it an ailing relative, but you can also view this as a sign. Rents are way more expensive. Some kinds of opportunities are drying up or have gone away. <laughs> and if you look at the blue line, people marrying or cohabiting, establishing households, what's happening to the blue line? The blue line's going down. So again, you can say, well, you know, we're fussier. In the old days, we made a lot of bad matches. Now we wait longer. To some extent, that's true. But I look at both of these lines together, and I have to say, I don't feel entirely good about the trend. It's a way in which different kinds of opportunities are drying up for people. Uh, there's less dynamism in the economy. And the reason for not getting married is just not having the income or the opportunity or the life position to attract a suitable mate. And my sense is the biggest factor driving these lines, including the decline in marriage, and it's not just people being fussy and finding the exact, correct, perfect Mr. or Mrs. Wright. It's that it's hard to marry properly when your own life prospects are not really working that great. There's some other data that uh, just came out. <clears throat> it's in a new book about the I, I generation. And it also shows, and this to me is a little surprising, but like, it fits the overall narrative. That today, people like your age are having less sex than they used to. But actually, sex kind of peaked in the 70s and 80s, and it's gone down. That's weird, isn't it? So the rate of sex is going down. But if you think about it, you're staying at home more. You're not like hanging out with your friends all the time. As a generation, you're getting driver's licenses at much lower rates and you're having less sex. So young generations tend to think of themselves like, oh, like we have more sex than our parents did. That's assumed, <laughs> but it's not true. Your parents put you to shame. <laughs> you're trying to catch up to them, and you are failing. <laughs> uh, the other interesting thing, I'm not sure this fits into my narrative, uh, the rate at which you smoke pot is not going up. 
I would say that's good. The rate at which your parents smoke pot is going up. And that's going up quite a bit. So first they beat you on sex, and then later on they beat you on pot. And you're all like sitting there listening to this guy talking about his theory of everything. <laughs> That's today's world. <laughs> and some of it is information technology. Some of it is the general rise in complacency, general decline in dynamism. This picture, you hear, oh, we live in the age of startups. Everyone's doing a startup. Or like everyone's in the gig economy. Everyone's working in tech. <clears throat> This is startups as a rate of total businesses. What do you see in that line? It's obvious, right? It's going down. So you think age of startups, you read it in all these magazine articles. Do the facts bear that out? Mostly they don't, right? Going down. There are some notable startups today. There's other facts. I don't have them on slides. But the chance that a startup becomes a very large company that also has been declining, not for as long as is shown in this graph, but for the last 20 years. So we don't really quite live in the age of startups, even though we have some notable ones. Oh, here, you know, I, I brought this slide because it says Raleigh Durham. <laughs> Top 10 places to live. And here they are. Just read through this for a moment. Washington, D.C., that's kind of where I live. Like, I feel that should be like higher. Boise, I don't know, I've never been there. But I'm 55, I've never been there. I feel that should be lower. <laughs> like, no one's really ever told me I had to go. Uh, I mean, I, the, the others I know, it strikes me as a, a pretty good list. You kind of wonder, well, should Connecticut be there? But they're bankrupt, actually. Um, <laughs> but a striking thing about this country, and this holds especially for the nice places to live. They have become much, much more segregated in terms of income, and across some, but not all variables, more segregated in terms of race. So we think of ourselves, oh, we're America, we had the civil rights movement, that was a great thing, right? Very significant victories were achieved. And then you think, well, that kind of kept on running, like it needs to run some more, we're still highly imperfect. You have this vague sense in the back of your mind like it's still running. But when you look at many, but again, not all of the data points, what you actually see is that some of the achievements of the civil rights movement are going in reverse. And the most significant feature driving this, I don't think it's that people are more prejudiced per se, but we are more segregated by income starting in the early 1990s. So rich people are more likely to live together and poor people are more likely to live together. And what's driving that is just the cost of buying homes in really nice neighborhoods. But as a secondary consequence, without thinking there has to be some increase in prejudice, that has meant in many parts of this country, segregation by kind of occupation has gone up, segregation by education has gone up, and very often segregation by race has gone up. Most of all in cities, suburbs actually have a much better recent history in terms of segregation by race. There's more integration. I see this where I live in Northern Virginia. But you go to rapidly growing cities, typically you're seeing much more segregation by race. That's some of the achievements of the civil rights movement running backwards, essentially. You see this also, the latest election. I knew many people who were Hillary Clinton supporters, <clears throat> and they said to me, they said, literally, I do not know a single Donald Trump voter. I know some Donald Trump voters. None of them said to me, I don't know a single Clinton voter. This is Washington, D.C., where only 4% of people voted for Trump. Even in Fairfax County, I think Fairfax County, Hillary Clinton was something like 83%. But it's very possible to drive across all of America from one coast to another and not hit a single county that Hillary Clinton won. Just take the right southern route, you can pass through only Trump voting counties. Or you can live somewhere like Washington and not know a single Trump voter. That too is a kind of segregation. It's harder to measure, but it seems pretty clear to me that it's going on. Whether you prefer Clinton, Trump, or something else, in my view, this is unhealthy for our politics. It would be better if we were more mixed by what you might call ideology. 
So these cities are tending to become more segregated across a lot of dimensions. Here's just a list, like Raleigh Durham, in terms of occupational, like blue collar versus white collar. It's the sixth most segregated place in all of America. So this, to me, is a worrying trend. If you look at the percentage of American blacks who are in majority white schools, you know, I said before, not every metric shows more segregation, but many do. This is one that does. The percentage of black students, K through 12, in majority white schools peaked at about 1990. And since then, it's gone down, not a little, but it's gone down a lot. So in 1990, it's at about 45%, which is like a lot of progress. And you see, like from 68 to 90, what's the trend there? That's incredible, like a very steep slope. That was a result of the civil rights movement, growing tolerance. But since 1990, due in part to income-related factors, you're just sliding back down, and we're almost at the point of being back to 1968. This, to me, a worrying sign. I would say it's coming from greater stultification, lower dynamism, fewer opportunities, and people just wanting to dig in to the safest possible neighborhood and being willing to spend more money to get their kid into that school that they think is the right school for that kid. Makes sense individually, perhaps, but when done collectively, the final result is an America that is, in some critical regards, more segregated than it used to be and running backwards in the wrong direction. So just to sum up and conclude before Q&A, I've talked only about the United States. For Western Europe and Japan, you can tell broadly similar stories. Obviously, segregation as an issue there is not at all like here. So some of the things change. But in general, do they have slowing productivity growth, slowing dynamism? Absolutely, yes. So this is true for almost all of the developed world. This is, in general, not true for China, for India, for many emerging economies. They are more dynamic, but they are also more chaotic. They have much higher levels of risk, income risk, political risk, environmental risk, many other problems. But precisely because they have the risk, they're more dynamic. Now, just to sum up, I mean, where does all of this end, right? And here, we don't know. At the end of my book, the last chapter, I put forward a hypothesis, and I call it the Great Reset. The Great Reset is, you might say, speculative. That is, I don't think there's any kind of direct evidence for the Great Reset. But my view of the Great Reset is that when your growth, productivity, and dynamism are falling, at some point, it gets hard to pay the bills. Our government also is less dynamic. More and more of our federal budget is absorbed by entitlements. Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, interest on the debt, defense budget. It's not quite fixed, but it's very hard to cut. So there's less and less money to play with, to fund science, to fund R&D, to send people to Mars, whatever you know, interesting new thing you might want to do to have an infrastructure bank. That's harder to do. The money isn't there. It's more spent on making people more secure. So our government has become more rigid. So the Great Reset comes, essentially, when we run out of money to pay off our debts. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen soon. But we will, at some point, possibly speculatively, approach a situation where a kind of chaos comes back down upon us, and American society actually is forced to be dynamic again, just as so many people in China, India, Nigeria are forced to be dynamic. They have harder lives. But they realize, well, risk is coming for me, so I better do something to preempt that. Not like, oh, my status quo is so great, I just want to dig myself in. So my postulate is there is something cyclical about this phenomenon. America will at some point return to a both more dynamic and more chaotic age. But for the time being, we are indeed living in the world of the complacent class. That's the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening.